Welcome to the third episode of History with a Twist. I'm Caroline. And I'm Elizabeth. Today we'll explore the adventures of one man during the dry or not so dry times during the 1920s. With the help of local distillery, Burlock and Barrel, we will also explore the city's relationship with distillation today. And let's not forget the star of our show, a Prohibition era recipe roundup that's ready for your own experimentation. The Roaring Twenties were a time of change, a time of growing cities, mass consumerism, music and film innovation, political change, and a time of bootleggers and rum runners. From 1920 to 1933, the Prohibition era in the U.S. was a national ban on the production, transportation, importation, and sale of alcoholic beverages. Supporters in favor of the 18th Amendment thought alcohol conflicted with public morals and health. The Volstead Act was enacted to enforce the 18th Amendment. At first, the amendment appeared to be working as alcohol consumption dropped and arrests for drunkenness fell. Of course, there was never enough manpower to effectively enforce every border, lake, river, and speakeasy. This offered the perfect opportunity for wet supporters to mobilize, turning law-abiding citizens to criminals, increasing racial divisions, and popularizing illicit drinking. 1920s Jacksonville was the center of the commercial, financial, and transportation industries in Florida, and later nicknamed the Gateway to Florida. Jacksonville was also the gateway city for rum runners smuggling product into the U.S. William McCoy and other rum runners were essential in stocking speakeasies and homes alike. Bill McCoy moved to Florida in the early 20th century and crafted yachts on the Halifax River for millionaires of his day, including Andrew Carnegie, Frederick Vanderbilt, and John Wanamaker. McCoy and his brother also operated a motorboat system and a boatyard in Holly Hill and near the Jacksonville shipyards. McCoy became a wealthy entrepreneur, but with the 18th Amendment, the tides changed for the McCoy brothers. During Prohibition, the McCoy brothers fell on hard times as the motorboat service could not compete with the growing highways built along the Florida coast. Needing a new adventure and to find another way to make a living, McCoy and his brother turned to rum running. Bill sailed the ships and Ben managed the business on land. With the purchase of his first fishing schooner, Henry L. Marshall, McCoy launched his smuggling venture. McCoy smuggled whiskey into the U.S. by traveling from Nassau in the Bahamas up the East Coast. He spent most of his time on Rum Row off Long Island, meaning that his ships, loaded with liquor, always stayed anchored just beyond the three-mile limit of U.S. jurisdiction. So you mean he just sat in international waters and let the buyers come to him? That's exactly what he did. At dark, smaller vessels would transport the goods to the designated ports. He was popular thanks to his fair prices, offers of free samples, and a free case per every order. BOGO! Now that's a good deal. While well, he considered himself an honest lawbreaker, that he never paid a dime to the politicians, law enforcement, or organized crime for protection, Bill's clever circumvention of U.S. law made him an enemy of the U.S. Coast Guard. A perfect example of McCoy's ability to find loopholes in the law would be the story of the Henry L. Marshall. The ship was purchased by McCoy, but to remove his connection from his rum running business, he quickly transferred ownership to a British national named Charles Albury, who lived in Nassau. The exact nature of the agreement was secret, but Albury probably received some of the profits, while McCoy retained control of the vessel that now flew the British flag to throw off the Coast Guard. In 1921, the Coast Guard eventually still seized control of the Henry L. Marshall and its liquor cargo near Rum Row, and the incident quickly became an international issue. Well, it sounds like the Coast Guard shouldn't have even been able to seize the ship since it was in international waters. That was definitely a problem. Despite this contention, McCoy and two others were still indicted for conspiracy in violating the Volstead Act. McCoy was not on the ship at the time of its seizure and managed to evade arrest, but was eventually captured with the seizure of his other ship, the Tomoka. In 1923, McCoy tried to outrun the Coast Guard in the Tomoka. Although he made it past the three-mile limit into international waters, McCoy surrendered to the Coast Guard after they fired a six-pound cannon shell at the vessel. 
hey, I would probably also surrender after that. It was said that during a hearing before the trial, when McCoy was asked about his defense, he said, I have no tale of woe to tell you. I was outside the three-mile limit, selling whiskey, and good whiskey, to anyone and everyone who wanted to buy. He pleaded guilty to smuggling and spent nine months in jail. McCoy returned to Florida and continued his boat building business with his brother, Ben. Captain McCoy and his crews may have been captured and sentenced for breaking the law, but his reputation continues today. Although a non-drinker, McCoy prided himself with providing genuine, uncut, and quality spirits, not the other inferior products that were common during this time. His products became known as the real McCoy, and this term is still used today in other idioms to describe something as the genuine article. McCoy is also credited with the invention of the burlock, a package holding six bottles, three on the bottom, then two, then one on top, with the whole burlock sewed in burlap. On the boats, it was more economical to store and handle liquor bottles in these triangular packages rather than in large crates. Speaking of the real McCoy, Jacksonville has a distillery directly inspired by Bill McCoy's legacy. Founded by Colin Edwards and Ian Hainsley, Burlock and Barrel is located in the Brooklyn neighborhood of Jacksonville, where they concentrate on perfecting American whiskeys. The business name was inspired by the Prohibition era and McCoy's invention of the Burlock. While the ingredients for whiskey may seem fairly simple, water, yeast, and grain, this process can differ greatly based on the distillery. For Ian and Colin, this process is more in line with the low technology methods of the 20th century. Let's hear it from them. You know, all the while we're stirring by hand or mashing by hand, so to speak. Uh, we also louder our grain by hand. When we come in the next day after we do the initial mash in, uh, we come in and with strainer bags, literally go through about 600 pounds of grain, removing it by hand from the liquid and then dumping the liquid into our fermentation vessel. So there's a lot of literal hands-on, not a lot of pumping, not a lot of the automation to it at all. Mm -hmm. It's very physical. Of course, when you enjoy their spirits, it's not just the hands-on method that makes them unique, but their location as well. And uh, we also have a more liberal fermentation process. And what I mean by that is we do open air fermentation. Okay. Um, so we add our own yeast, but there is yeast that comes off the river that's naturally in the air that will make it sway into our, uh, our wash or distiller's beer. So it gives it kind of more of a unique flavor mm -hmm. um, that's unique to the area, even the neighborhood. Now that we've covered a little bit about how whiskey is made, let's shake it up with our cocktail recipes. In the spirit of Bill McCoy, we're offering two recipes for the price of one episode. What? Our burlock and barrel inspired recipe is a jalapeno honey mule using two parts of their jalapeno honey whiskey to one part ginger beer, garnished with a lime wedge. If you're looking for a more prohibition-style cocktail, look no further than the classic Old Fashioned, a drink that was popular before the Volstead Act and survived prohibition to become the drink we know today. With limited supplies, most bartenders during prohibition were stuck with serving degraded whiskeys and other spirits which were unpleasant to drink. They had to get creative, so they added sugar and bitters to tame the burn, later adding citrus or cherries to the mix. America's fondness for all things sweet helped popularize this drink even when better quality spirits were available. In case you're not already familiar with an old fashioned, it is a simple drink that can be customized to your own liking. Our favorite old fashioned requires two ounces of burlock and barrel whiskey, a little sugar and water, dash of bitters, and a lemon twist. Try this recipe with your favorite whiskey or garnish share your creation, and tag us with Atmosh Jacks. To learn more about Burlock and Barrels Whiskey, keep a lookout for the Mosh After Dark coming this fall. We also want to give a shout out to those that made this episode possible, including Burlock and Barrel, the Jacksonville Historical Society, and our very own Mosh crew. Cheers! Thanks for tuning in to History with a Twist. Keep a lookout for future episodes and tasty cocktail recipes 
brought to you by Mosh Connect. If there's any local history you'd like to learn more about, send us a message at info at themosh.org. All of our content is available for free at themosh.org slash educate slash connect. If you enjoyed this show, show your support and make a donation so we can continue to create programs like this. And if you haven't already, follow us on social media at Mosh Jacks to stay connected. Until next time. <laughs>